Our bodies require two groups of micronutrients on a regular basis in order to function properly, vitamins and minerals. While vitamins are the organic compounds that our body needs, minerals are inorganic substances that our bodies need in relatively small amounts on a regular basis for many of our biological processes to function properly. In this video, we're going to learn all about minerals, where they come from, and what they do to help our bodies function normally. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Like vitamins, minerals are classified as micronutrients. They are nutrients that we need in relatively small quantities on a regular basis, but nevertheless, they are essential. Minerals are divided into two classes, major minerals and trace minerals, based on their, the quantities that are needed on a, rel, on a regular basis. Things that are classified as major minerals, sodium, potassium, chloride, calcium, magnesium, sulfur, these are things that we need to get in quantities greater than 100 milligrams on a, per day on a regular basis. Other minerals, known as trace minerals, things such as selenium and manganese and iron, these are things that we need to get in slightly less abundance, less than 100 milligrams per day in order for our bodies to function properly. One of the things that we need to understand about minerals is that minerals compared to vitamins are absorbed uh, significantly less efficiently in our bodies. And in fact, depending on the source where we get these minerals, they can be absorbed uh, quite poorly. For example, if you're getting minerals from plant-based sources, plants often contain substances such as phytates and oxalates that can make it even harder for our bodies to absorb the minerals that we get through our diet. Fortunately, some of the vitamins that we consume actually can aid in the absorption of certain minerals. For example, vitamin C is incredibly helpful for our bodies in terms of taking up iron from our diet. Vitamin D is also very good at helping our bodies to absorb calcium as a part of our diet. What we're going to talk about in this video is where the different where these different minerals can be acquired and obtained through our diet as well as how they're absorbed and what they do once they get inside of our bodies the essential processes the essential roles that they play in proper bodily functions we'll start our conversation today with calcium calcium is the most abundant mineral found in our bodies Calcium is important for numerous processes in our body, including nerve transmission, muscle contraction, and the activation of blood clotting factors. And because of its importance to these processes, blood calcium levels are rigorously and tightly controlled by the body. And when blood calcium levels drop too low, our body readily activates calcium stores to maintain healthy levels in the blood. Calcium is predominantly stored in our bone, and its job is to function to harden both bone and teeth. In fact, 65% or so of bone actually consists of calcium salts. And in these salt compounds, calcium acts to strengthen and harden bones. And when our body needs to increase blood calcium levels, it does so by initiating a process called bone reabsorption. And what happens there is these calcium stores are activated, the salts are then released into the bloodstream, and the calcium levels can be, the calcium from the bone can be used to maintain normal blood calcium levels so that those functions that I just talked about can happen properly. The downside to this is if you're not getting enough dietary calcium, you are actually weakening your bones over time because as your body seeks to maintain healthy calcium levels, it's doing so at the expense of bone strength. And correspondingly, insufficient levels of calcium can actually result in uh, weakened bones and, and conditions such as osteoporosis. So how does our body actually regulate calcium levels? Well, it utilizes three hormones, parathyroid hormone, vitamin D, and calcitonin. Uh, these three hormones are, uh, or or endocrine signals are used by our body to help decide whether or not our body needs to uh, reabsorb more bone to release calcium or to shut that process off. Parathyroid hormone actually acts to initiate the process of bone resorption and in doing so also helps to activate vitamin D. Uh, vitamin D. When parathyroid hormone is released, bone resorption occurs and calcium begins to enter into the bloodstream. 
parathyroid hormone also has the ability to tell the kidneys to reabsorb more calcium from the blood and prevent its excretion. Vitamin D is also activated during this process, and vitamin D also aids in the process of helping our bodies take up more calcium uh, from dietary sources to help replenish uh, calcium stores that are being depleted as our body seeks to reabsorb bone in order to get, maintain healthy blood calcium levels. Once healthy calcium levels have been restored in the blood, another hormone known as calcitonin is produced. Calcitonin actually shuts off the process of parathyroid hormone, and this resets the process so that uh, bone can then be remodeled and we can stop uh, the process of bone resorption and releasing calcium into the bloodstream. Now, there may be some benefits to a high calcium diet. Um, some evidence supports the fact that high calcium diets may reduce the risk of certain cancers. However, there may be an increased risk of other cancers uh, in, in response to having high levels of calcium. That's research that is still ongoing uh, to help clarify exactly what's happening there. There's also some evidence that dietary calcium can help prevent the formation of kidney stones. However, it does appear that this must be from dietary sources of calcium rather than supplementation, as overconsumption of calcium supplements may actually increase the risk of developing kidney stones. So as you may well know, calcium supplements can be found in pretty much every pharmacy and supermarket in the country. And the reason why is calcium supplementation may be helpful in maintaining bone health. There is some evidence that calcium supplementation may help to prevent osteoporosis or prevent the worsening of that syndrome, although some of that data is a bit murky. The interesting thing to note is that calcium supplementation isn't without consequence. So one of the things you have to be really important uh, be really careful of is uh, it does appear that a significant number of calcium supplements that are on the market also come with a high amount of lead. Um, and it really depends on where that calcium is sourced from. So uh, there was a recent study that showed that about a third of major calcium supplement brands uh, do contain somewhat dangerous levels of lead. Um, those were predominantly sourced from oyster shells or, or, um, or sort of processed calcium carbonate. Um, those seem to be the ones that have the most lead in them, but uh, because of where calcium is typically sourced, you need to be careful that you're not taking in uh, too much lead uh, with that particular calcium supplement. Now, the other thing to note is that calcium supplementation works best when it is done in conjunction with vitamin D supplementation. As you recall, vitamin D is a very important uh, vitamin uh, that helps you boost your body's ability to absorb calcium. The other thing to be careful about is this. While there is some evidence that calcium supplementation can be helpful, the overconsumption of calcium supplements may not only be unhelpful, but may actually be dangerous and may contribute to other complications. For example, increased cancer risk and the increased formation of kidney stones that could actually cause more problems than simply not taking calcium supplements at all. So where are you gonna get your calcium in your diet and how much do you actually need? Well, calcium comes predominantly from dairy products. Um, it's found in abundance in many different dairy products, milks, cheese, yogurts, um, but you can also get it from fortified cereals and grains. Um, calcium has uh, been found to be supplemented in numerous things. Uh, many cereals, many grains, breads, even orange juice can come uh, with a fair amount of calcium now supplemented into it. How much do you need? Well, children need to consume somewhere between 700 and 1300 milligrams per day, uh, varying with age. In adulthood, you typically need about 1,000 milligrams per day um, until you hit about age 50. Once you hit age 50, they're gonna up it uh, to uh, 1,200 milligrams per day um, if you are a woman once you hit about age 50. Uh, and then once you hit age 71, everybody's gonna need to get 1,200 milligrams per day in order to maintain normal, healthy bodily function. The next major mineral that we'll discuss is phosphorus. Phosphorus is the second most abundant uh, mineral found in our bodies. But in, um, in our bodies, it doesn't typically exist in its raw form. In fact, it can't because it's a pretty harmful uh, metalloid. In fact, it exists mainly as the compound phosphate. And phosphate is found in numerous, uh, pros uh, numerous different biological molecules. So phosphate is important um, to form the backbones of DNA and RNA. It's found um, in uh, ATP, the cellular energy currency but it's predominantly found in a compound with calcium inside bones and teeth. So recall that calcium is used to harden and strengthen bone and teeth um, in the formation of a salt. Many times that salt is calcium phosphate. 
So accordingly, uh, phosphate levels are regulated similarly to calcium levels. What's interesting is um, when parathyroid hormone actually acts to help um, regulate calcium levels, it also regulates phosphate. And to, uh, parathyroid hormone can also regulate the uh, excretion of phosphates in response to uh, calcium and bone resorption. So when the bone gets resorbed, calcium phosphates make it into the bloodstream. The calcium is what is needed in the bloodstream, um, and the phosphate actually gets excreted. Consequently, you need to maintain a fairly regular uh, intake of phosphorus or phosphates in order to, uh, to maintain healthy levels and to maintain proper bone health. So where are you going to get your phosphorus from and how much do you need? Well, uh, you can get your phosphorus from numerous uh, uh, food sources, things like uh, meat, uh, shellfish, uh, dairy, as well as processed foods and some beverages uh, have relatively uh, abundant amounts of uh, phosphate inside of them. Uh, how much do you need? Well, as a child, you need somewhere between 400 and 1250 milligrams per day, depending on your age. In adulthood, it's set pretty standard at about 700 milligrams per day um, being required uh, for normal, healthy bodily functions. The third most abundant mineral in your body is sulfur, and sulfur is found almost exclusively in proteins, where it is a component of two major amino acids, methionine and cysteine. Um, methionine and cysteine are found in countless proteins in your body, including antioxidant proteins such as glutathione and many enzymes that are needed for metabolic processes to occur. Correspondingly, the way you get sulfur into your diet is predominantly through the consumption of proteins. In fact, it's really hard not to get a proper amount of sulfur in your diet, and as such, there actually this is the only mineral that doesn't have a recommended daily allowance. You don't have any sort of required amount of this, because as long as you eat a proper amount of protein, you're most likely going to be fine. You can get that, you can get that from eating things like meat, fish, poultry, uh, other major sources of protein, but you can also get it from things like cruciferous vegetables uh, to get adequate amounts of sulfur. So as long as your diet is containing a sufficient amount of proteins, whether it's from animals or plant sources, you really don't have to worry too much about getting sulfur, uh, enough sulfur in your diet. The final major mineral that we'll talk about is magnesium. Magnesium, about 60% of it is actually found in the bone, but rather than being inside making up that hardened structure like calcium and phosphate are, magnesium actually sits on top, sort of providing the outer coating or the finishing touch to help to harden the bones to maintain proper bone health. And as such, magnesium deficiency has been linked with an increased risk in osteoporosis and other diseases that result from the weakening of the bones. Magnesium is important for other processes as well. Uh, for example, pretty much any reaction in your body that hydrolyzes ATP as an energy source requires magnesium as a cofactor for that to happen. And since that is most metabolic reactions in your cell, magnesium is essential for the production of carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids, the four major biomolecules uh, the, uh, that, we've, that we've spoken about in previous videos. What's interesting is, despite the importance of magnesium and the relatively low abundance in which it's required, most of the human population is believed to be deficient in magnesium. Magnesium can actually be obtained from numerous sources. It's a, it's a major component of chlorophyll, which is what gives plants their green color. So magnesium is abundant in any, of, any, any food source that contains uh, leafy greens, so things like lettuce and spinach and collard greens and, and, and vegetables like that. It's also abundant in meat, it's found in fish, it can be found in nuts, um, and several other sources. So uh, how much magnesium do you need to not be deficient? Well, that depends like most other nutrients on your age. Children need to get somewhere between 80 and 400 milligrams of magnesium a day, depending on their age. In adulthood, it's between 400 and 420 milligrams per day. But I said, as I said, it's pretty interesting that a significant proportion of the human population probably isn't getting enough magnesium as a normal part of their diet, despite the fact that it's found in many different foods. Now we'll move on to the trace minerals, and we'll start with Iron. Iron is probably the best understood trade, uh, trace mineral in terms of its function and its importance to the body. Iron is important for many things that happen in your body. It's important for iron containing compounds such as hemoglobin and myoglobin. Hemoglobin is a major component of red blood cells and without the iron component of the hemoglobin protein, hemoglobin is unable to transport oxygen and other gases throughout your body, which means essentially you're unable to survive if you don't get enough iron in your diet. It's also an important cofactor uh, for numerous enzymes, including many of those that reside in your liver cells that help to detoxify harmful substances. It's important for electron transport chain function so that your body can properly produce ATP from, from food sources. 
Iron plays a number of important processes in your body, as you can see, which is why it's so important to maintain a proper amount of iron in your diet. Interestingly, iron deficiency is actually a worldwide problem. And one of the major consequences to being iron deficient is something known as anemia, which simply means that your body does not have enough iron, and this can make it difficult for your body to maintain production, the proper amount level of production of red blood cells. The World Health Organization estimates that upwards of 80% of the human population is iron deficient, and, and about 20% of those people actually suffer from some form of iron deficient anemia as a consequence of that. So where do we get iron from and how much do we actually need? Well, iron is pretty readily available in many animal products. So red meat, for example, is a great source of iron. And it turns out that animal-based foods are significantly better sources of iron than plant-based foods. About 60% of iron that you get from animal-based foods or meats uh, predominantly come from hemoglobin and hemoglobin based iron is significantly more bioavailable. It's easier for your body to access that iron than it is from other sources. Iron is also found in a number of plant based foods. The problem with this is all plants plant based iron is non heme iron, which means that it's much harder for your body to actually get the iron out of. That's also actually compounded by the fact that many plants contain things like phytates, oxalates and tannins. All of these make it more challenging for your body to actually take up the requisite amount of iron. However, uh, iron uptake can be aided by, by getting your iron in conjunction with vitamin C. As you recall, vitamin C is an important cofactor that promotes iron uptake in your body. Consequently, some supplements actually come as iron plus vitamin C to help the person who is taking the iron supplement to help their body to actually take up um, more of the iron that's actually in the supplement than they otherwise would. So how much iron do you need to get in your diet? Children, it's somewhere between seven and 11 milligrams per day. For adult males, it's eight milligrams per day. Um, and for adult women, it's 18 milligrams per day until they reach about age 50. At age 50, it drops to eight milligrams today per day for all adults. There is an upper limit uh, for the amount of iron you should take. It's actually 40 milligrams per day for all humans, regardless of age. And the reason why is that for most people, um, our body actually sheds very little iron. Therefore, it's easy for iron to accumulate in our body if you take too much in. And that can cause some very painful side effects um, because it begins to accumulate in our organs and it begins to accumulate in our muscles. And this can be very painful and iron toxicity can take a, a, a really long time to uh, fix itself because our body typically sheds so little iron on a regular basis. So you want to be careful that if you are taking iron supplements that you're not taking too much because it can be very toxic and, um, and, and potentially fatal um, if it's not treated. The next trace mineral we'll talk about is copper. So copper is important for a couple of things. It's important one for helping to increase iron, iron uh, absorption as well as iron transport. So copper seems to help iron in that capacity. It's also important for electron transport chain function, uh, much like iron is. Um, iron is really needed in very sparing amounts. So children, for example, need somewhere between 350 and 700 micrograms of copper on a daily basis, uh, whereas adults need about 900 micrograms on a daily basis. Copper can be obtained through numerous sources. Organ meats are a good source, uh, meats, uh, seeds, and then certain foods are actually fortified with copper. Uh, copper is actually absorbed by the intestine and kind of stored in the liver. Um, and if our body needs to get rid of excess copper, it actually does so by releasing it into the bile that gets passed into our small intestine to aid in digestion. And then it gets secreted in our feces as a result of that. The next trace element we'll talk about is zinc. Uh, so zinc is important for numerous processes. There are about 200 proteins in our body that we know about that require zinc um, as a cofactor in order to function properly. Some of these are involved in DNA and RNA synthesis. Other ones are involved in um, you know, activating or deactivating the expression of certain genes. Um, what's interesting is that zinc deficiency early in life can result in um, the stunting of growth. So people who are zinc deficient uh, during development may never actually reach their uh, a proper adult height. They can be significantly shorter or underdeveloped um, as a result of a lack of zinc. In adults, it actually causes like muscle weakness and hair loss if you're not getting enough zinc. Uh, zinc is fairly readily obtained 
um, either through supplementation, but as part of our diet, meats and seafood are great sources of the necessary zinc we need in order to survive. Um, and uh, what we, we actually don't require all that much uh, zinc in our diet in order to have proper bodily functions. In children, it's three to eight milligrams per day, again, based on age. Adult males need around 11 milligrams per day, while adult females need about eight milligrams per day uh, of zinc in their diet for, to, to, to remain healthy. Like zinc, selenium is required as a cofactor for a number of enzymes. Um, in fact, there are about 25 known enzymes that require selenium as one of their cofactors. What's interesting is many of these are actually antioxidants. So uh, they function alongside vitamin C and vitamin E as a way of removing those harmful free radicals from our body. And in fact, because selenium uh, containing enzymes can, do a, uh, can, can assist so heavily uh, in this process, it actually acts to help spare vitamin E. Um, as a part of that process. So if, if, if these enzymes, if you're getting enough selenium and these enzymes are functioning properly, it may actually cut back on the amount of vitamin C or vitamin E that you actually need in your diet uh, because these are aiding in the process of, of, of removing these harmful um, free radicals or reactive oxygen species from our body. Like zinc, uh, selenium is fairly readily available in meats and seafoods and it's required in relatively small abundance. Specifically, children need around 40 micrograms per day, while adults need around 50 micrograms per day in order to remain healthy. Iodine is also an important trace mineral that we need to get in our diet. Iodine is actually important for the function of our thyroid. In fact, uh, in the absence of iodine, our body can't produce thyroid hormone. And thyroid hormone is really important for regulating our metabolism. Um, in, the, and with a, in the absence of enough iodine in the diet, uh, people develop something called a goiter, which is a, a, a swelling of the thyroid, um, which can be quite noticeable. And if, in addition to this, people can be fatigued, uh, they can suffer from weight loss, um, and uh, a host of other symptoms that are associated with iron, uh, iodine deficiency. So iodine actually is found almost exclusively from the sea. So uh, things like fish and seafood are, uh, have a relatively high uh, concentration of iodine in them. And if you consume them in your diet, you can actually get um, a, a sufficient amount of iodine that way. Um, the other major source of iodine in most diets is actually iodized salt. So uh, uh, several years ago, we began introducing uh, iodine into table salt um, to make sure that people are getting a sufficient amount of iodine because it was actually discovered that a, a significant proportion of the human population simply wasn't getting enough iodine from their diet. Um, a lot of these were in populations that were too far away from the ocean. Um, if you're too far away from the ocean, then you're not going to have access to uh, fish and shellfish. I mean, at least a while back, it's a little bit different now with uh, the ability to transport foods um, safely across larger distances. Uh, but nevertheless, populations that are significantly far away from the ocean tend to have higher incidences of iodine deficiency. How much do you need to get? Children, somewhere between 90 and 150 micrograms per day of iodine is sufficient. Um, that obviously varies with age. Adults need 150 micrograms a day uh, uh, in order to uh, prevent iodine deficiency and the associated uh, signs and symptoms that are associated with that. Chromium is another trace mineral that we need in sufficient amounts to maintain normal body health. In the case of chromium, its role in the body is somewhat murky. We, knew, we do know that it is required for the effectiveness of insulin, and we also know that it plays some role in carbohydrate, fat, and protein metabolism. People who are deficient in chromium um, typically exhibit weight loss, they may exhibit peripheral neuropathy, and they could also demonstrate elevated levels of blood glucose and free fatty acids. Chromium can be obtained through meats, nuts, and green vegetables. Uh, children typically need somewhere between uh, 10 and 25 micrograms per day, uh, with adults needing somewhere between 30 and 35 micrograms per day. Manganese is another trace mineral that's necessary for the function of certain enzymes. Uh, these are the ones that are involved in the production of carbohydrates and cholesterol. People who are deficient in manganese uh, typically exhibit uh, nausea and vomiting. They may also uh, exhibit dermatitis, uh, decreased growth of hair and nails, and they can even have skeletal defects depending on when during the developmental process they are deficient in manganese. Manganese can be acquired through fruits, nuts, and legumes. 
um, and is required in different quantities depending on age. Children are going to need somewhere between 1.2 and 1.9 milligrams per day. Adults either 2.3 milligrams per day for men or 1.8 milligrams per day for women. Molybdenum is an interesting trace mineral. Molybdenum is required for a couple of different processes. First off, about molybdenum, the amino the sulfur-containing amino acids, methionine and cysteine, um, can't be produced in sufficient abundance in order for survival. It's also important for the metabolism of the nitrogen-containing compounds that are found in DNA and RNA. Now, molybdenum is found in nuts and legumes. Uh, and what's interesting is molybdenum um, content within those food products is actually dependent on the concentration within the soil. So the types of nuts, legumes, and other food sources that contain molybdenum and how much it contains vary across the world. Um, and it really depends on just what is the molybdenum concentration within the soil in which these, uh, which these uh, vegetables are actually grown. How much do you, molybdenum do you need in your diet? Well, children need somewhere between 17 and 34 micrograms of molybdenum on a daily basis. Adults need about 50 micrograms of molybdenum in their diet in order to maintain normal body health. The final trace mineral that we'll discuss is fluoride. And fluoride is most prominently known for its role in maintaining healthy teeth. And that's because fluoride plays uh, uh, an important role in helping to make sure that our body is able to produce and restore sufficient enamel when the teeth become damaged, but it also helps to block the metabolism of the bacteria that secrete acids that help to damage the enamel in the first place. Many people don't get enough fluoride in their diet naturally, and as a consequence, what has happened in the United States um, and several other countries over the past, uh, the past several decades is the introduction of fluoridated water into municipal water sources. By, producing, put, by putting small amounts of fluoride into our drinking water, we are able to obtain a sufficient amount of fluoride on a regular basis, um, and, and the result has been a dramatic decline in the number of cavities and other dental problems associated with weakened enamel um, and the bacteria that exist in our teeth. The thing to be careful about is not all people in the United States have access to fluoridated water. Um, municipal water supplies do have fluoridated water, but if you get your water from a well or are getting it from another source, uh, such as bottled water, you're not getting the necessary fluoride in order to help maintain proper, uh, proper dental hygiene. Today we talked all about minerals. We talked about the major minerals, things like calcium and magnesium. Uh, and we talked about the, the trace minerals, things like iron and selenium and chromium. Uh, there are a couple other major minerals that we didn't talk about in this video, namely sodium, potassium, and chloride. Those were covered in my previous video on electrolytes. Um, they are classified as major minerals. In fact, they're probably needed in higher concentrations than many of the major minerals that we actually spoke about today. But if you're interested in learning about those, please see my other video uh, on electrolytes and talk about the function of those three minerals that are needed as part of our diet. I hope you learned a lot today. Thank you so much for tuning in and I look forward to